Welcome to the second segment for the inflammatory myopathies. In the first segment, we provided a general introduction to this family of conditions and discussed the difficulties in making a diagnosis. Over the next three segments, we will look at three of these conditions in turn, starting with polymyositis. In this segment, we look at the patient presentation, pathophysiology, treatment options, and prognosis for those diagnosed with polymyositis. The term polymyositis provides a general description of the patient presentation pattern involving inflammation to and weakness of a number of large muscle groups, typically involving the shoulder and hip girdle musculature. This is why it is not uncommon for initial workups to focus on limb girdle muscular dystrophy as a likely diagnosis. The incident rate is fairly rare, affecting only about a half dozen individuals in a million. The condition is also more common in the black population and in women when compared to men. The precise cause of polymyositis is not fully understood, but is an autoimmune response that may be triggered in susceptible individuals by such causative agents as viral infections or malignancies. Evidence suggests that the condition starts as a T-cell mediated attack against an as of yet unidentified antigen. While there is some variability with the initial symptom presentation, the most consistent finding is bilateral muscle weakness within the proximal appendicular muscle groups. Patients may present with general concerns about weakness when standing from a seated position or with activities that require raising the hands over the head, such as hair brushing or reaching for objects on high shelves. These symptoms tend to be more challenging in the morning, but improve as the day progresses. Note that this is the opposite of what is typically observed with myasthenia gravis. Weakness may also affect the bulbar muscles, leading to difficulties with swallowing. The patient may also report pain, fatigue, and fever, but these findings are inconsistent. As previously mentioned, blood tests are expected to show elevations in creatine kinase, aldolase, and if measured, elevated levels of antinuclear antigen and rheumatoid factor. The critical test in making a diagnosis comes with muscle biopsy samples. The main finding in this patient population is inflammatory infiltration of the endomesial connective tissue layer surrounding individual muscle cells. This is typically composed of a combination of CD8 plus T lymphocytes and macrophages. Muscle fibers found within these regions of inflammation will demonstrate various signs of regeneration and necrosis. The local capillary network may also demonstrate damage, but larger arterioles will appear histologically normal. As with most autoimmune diseases, there is no cure for this condition. Research on the best treatment options for polymyositis is sparse due to the rarity of the condition. At this moment, prednisone is typically prescribed at a dose of 1 mg per kilogram per day for a period of 1 to 2 months until blood creatine kinase levels fall indicating muscle damage has ceased. At this point, prednisone administration is reduced to control the disease. This is a challenging point in the treatment phase, as there is a delicate balance between controlling the symptoms of polymyositis and minimizing the adverse effects related to corticosteroid use. The patient should be carefully monitored for the adverse effects of corticosteroid treatment, including weight gain, hypertension, and diabetes. MRI may be used to monitor for steroid myopathy to further regulate dosage. Prognosis is generally good once an ideal corticosteroid dose is achieved, although complications related to chronic corticosteroid use may lead to morbidity. One other complication is the presence of anti-JO1 autoantibodies, which target the histidyl tRNA synthetase enzyme. These antibodies are highly specific to the inflammatory myopathies, and polymyositis in particular, being present in as many as a quarter of all patients with the condition. The presence of anti-JO1 is a poor prognostic indicator and puts the patient at an increased risk of interstitial lung disease. That concludes this segment on polymyositis. In the next segment, we will look at the second of the three main types of inflammatory myopathies, which also has a dermatological component, the appropriately named dermatomyositis.